Coming up on Tech News Today, your email just got a lot more private thanks to the Fourth Amendment and the Sixth District Court. We'll explain. Also, a bunch of people are picking on Chrome OS. Well, we're going to stand up for it for once. And will Comcast win the set-top box race to bring you Internet TV? All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, December 14th, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford and Voice Activated Sync, featuring true hands free calling, turn by turn directions, 911 assist, and more. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. And by Gazelle, the easy way to sell or recycle the used gadgets lying around your home or office. For a 5% bonus payment for your used gadgets, go to gazelle.com, bonus code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the Tech News of the Day. Joining us to help us dig through it today, uh, Editor-in-Chief of Wired.co.uk, Nate Langson. Welcome, Nate. Thank you very much. Pleased to be here. And also very happy to have along uh, once again, host of This Week of Google and blogger at Smarterware.org, Gina Trapani. How are you, you doing, Gina? Doing great. Great to be here. It's great to have you both here. Uh, since in honor of This Week in Google, we'll start with a Google story. Gmail's founder, who is no longer a Google employee. How do you say his name? Paul Bouchite? Bouchite. I thought it was Bouchite. 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 Uh, said on Tuesday that he thinks Google will kill Chrome OS within a year. He doesn't see the need for it. He says Chrome OS has no purpose that isn't better served by Android. Yeah. He also thinks he's going to be merged with Android or could be merged with Android. So you just bring the Chrome browser to Android if that... If that that's what that sounds like. I guess like. in a way, you would you would take all the, the highlights of the development of Chrome and sort of bring those over into Android and just big up Android for a tablet version or something, which frankly makes a lot of sense. But I, I doubt that Chrome OS will even be fully baked in a year, let alone killable, um, you know, after proving it's not working. So <laughs> it's a good point. I mean, I definitely want to see Chrome and all the web apps kind of show up on Android, but Android doesn't have that the really fast start startup speed that Chrome OS has. Um, and, and, it, and it certainly doesn't have the kind of rich browser capabilities that, um, that Chrome has yet. So I would like to see Chrome show up on Android, but I'm not sure that uh, that's going to happen within a year. I think we've seen with iOS and we've now seen with Android that you actually have to tweak the operating system quite a bit. Maybe not 100%, but you have to tweak it a bit to get it to work as well on a tablet as it does on a phone. We've, you know, we've we had different versions of iOS for a long time. So there's lots of different tweaks, and, and, and Android is making a version specifically meant to work on the tablet. Isn't that even more true when you move it up to a netbook or a laptop level? That is, isn't there a real reason to have a different operating system for, for that level of machine? Well, I think the, the advantage there is really to do with the, the, the hardware it's running on, um, you know, because the OS needs to be able to run on, say, an Intel chip or on, a, on an ARM chip. Um, and Android can't necessarily do that, to the best of my knowledge, and that's something that the Chrome could address. Um, but at the actual sort of base feature set, um, it makes a lot of sense to, um, you know, just to merge the two eventually. But I mean, the key thing that Chrome OS has is that it just starts up the machine so fast and that you just start working. You don't have to tweak anything except maybe like what network you're going to connect to. Um, and Android just d definitely doesn't offer that experience right now. The other advantage uh, of Chrome OS, you're totally right, Gina, uh, is that it is backed up into the cloud. So if you pick up someone else's Chrome OS machine, you just log in and all your stuff's there. But that's the problem Richard Stallman has with it. Uh, Richard Stallman, founder of the Free Software Foundation and creating of the operating system GNU, says in general, that he doesn't trust the cloud, uh, that you risk losing the legal rights to your data when you store things in the cloud. And he thinks Chrome OS is the worst example of this. Is he, is he got something, is that a real worry? If we, if we put everything in the cloud, can the government just march in and take your data anytime they want? I, th I think they can. I think they can do that. I think there is a genuine risk with storing everything in the cloud. I think that the the best solution is the kind of solution that um, things like Dropbox has, which is where you have a version on your desktop that is constantly there, 
Uh, you can encrypt it if you want to, but it's backed up on a centralized system. So you can access it if your machine fails or if you, um, uh, if you lose it or get it stolen or something like that. Um, whereas stalling everything solely in the cloud, you know, I don't like doing that. I like having my Gmail in my mail app on uh, OS 10, knowing that it's kind of half and half. And that's the solution that I like. And that's a solution that I think will uh, we'll see as a trend going forward. So I'm sort of half with him on that, not for the security concerns, more for just purely the practicality of having an offline and an online copy in sync with each other. So you're just more worried about the uh, the the safety of your data, not the not the government aspect. Gina, does does any of this bother you? Or are you comfortable storing in the cloud? Um, I think that Stallman has a little bit. I see a little bit of his point. I'm not. I'm not quite as extreme as he is, but I see his point, which is that uh, the ability to put everything in the cloud is kind of the slippery slope. Like it, he said, he called it careless computing. Like it. It makes it very easy for folks to maybe store things on uh, in web apps that maybe they wouldn't have before. Uh, right? If they had a full computer, when they can encrypt their own documents and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I do think it's a concern. But you know, when you send an email, it, go through, it goes through lots of servers. It's not private. You know, it's it's a postcard essentially, and so that's why I, I'm okay with using Gmail. And also, you know, it's like I trust my accountant to do my to do my taxes, and you know, I trust Google to. I've made the choice to trust Google to store my data, and that's a choice that I've made as a consumer. Yeah, I, I trust banks to store my money. I don't keep right. it keep it under a mattress. Uh, right. There's a long historic system that's been built up there that we have yet to get to uh, with data, but that doesn't mean we can't get there. Uh, and when you talk about email, there's an important decision today. The Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals has ruled that the government needs a warrant if they want to get at your emails. They're probably better off, like you said, just tapping them out on the open internet where they're unencrypted and anybody can grab them because they are sort of a postcard. But uh, they cannot just march in with a court order uh, to an ISP and say, hand over all the emails from Nate Langston or Gina Trapani, they have to go and get a warrant uh, according to this decision. And, and the EFF, among others, are touting this as a huge victory for privacy. Yeah, this is this is a really great, important decision. Um, I, I mean, I, I think there's this reasonable expectation that your your email is private and you're storing it on someone else's server. It's still your account and a high level of, you know, you expect it to be treated the way that your postal box would be treated. Um, and so this was always a big argument that Stallman actually used in one of his war warnings about storing your email, say, in Gmail, is that is it this issue. And now it's sort of been resolved. So I hope that this hopefully this sets a precedent for further uh, kind of uh, rulings like this. And Nate, you said you're not quite sure where this stands in, in the UK as far as being able to uh, protect your email. That, that issue hasn't really been tested there yet. Yeah, I mean, this this is um, this is very much a US case. It's, it, this isn't something that can set a precedent in the UK. Uh, at the moment, we have um, kind of a voluntary code of practice for ISP data retention that um, uh, spans everything from uh, your uh, IP address of people you connect to on IM to email. It doesn't store the contents of email though. And basically ISPs in the UK have a voluntary uh, obligation as such um, to retain the data of who you're talking to via email and IM and things like that, as opposed to the content of the email itself. So this really is kind of a totally separate issue and I'm not sure uh, at the moment how that's how that would be, uh, what, what a UK version of this law would be, or if there is one, I'm not quite sure what it is, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I think this is clearly a massive, massive um, sort of victory for data privacy in the US. It's a huge deal. Uh, the Gawker hack uh, is a setback for privacy in a, in a practical sense. Uh, it's sort of taking the spot in our lineup that, that WikiLeaks took last week. Uh, they are working with the FBI now. Dick Denton uh, discussed with the New York Post that the FBI is in New York and looking into uh, the hack to try to track down the person responsible. Uh, Gawker uh, passwords, as you might know, it caused a lot of other companies to look at their security and even warn their users. In fact, Blizzard is telling users of World of Warcraft that uh, they need to reset their passwords if their email is in that Gawker uh, media account, uh, Gawker media website or if their email shows up in that in that file and yahoo is doing the same thing in fact like yahoo is just resetting their passwords as part of their ongoing security measures if they find your email in that text file is that a good thing gina is that that other companies are leaping on this and take being proactive 
I do think it's a good thing. And I should start by saying I work for Gawker for five years. They still pay me occasionally at Lifehacker. It's Lifehacker is one of the Gawker sites. So I wanted to put that out there. I do think it's a good idea that other companies are jumping on and saying, hey, you know what? We're going to proactively protect against uh, people using this account data. Um, because you know what? I know personally by tech, talking to the tech team at Gawker, it takes a really long time to get this fixed and get the notification out to folks and, and let them know what's going on. And for other companies to kind of proactively defend against it, you know, we saw the Twitter hack uh, Sunday night or the Twitter spamming um, situation where people were grabbing usernames and passwords from that dump for Twitter. You want to really kind of avoid avoid that kind of thing. So I do think it's a good thing. Although, why is it that we're doing this on the Gawker hack and companies really didn't do it on other database dumps like this where email addresses have, have come out? Is it because it's so high profile and tech users tend to use a lot more services than, say, people who've signed up for McDonald's? I think that's the reason why. I think that Gawker has a pretty savvy audience um, and uh, the, the same kind of audience that's going to use Twitter and going to use Facebook and going to use these other services like LinkedIn or Wow. Uh, so, so I think that there seems to be a bigger risk there. Yeah, LinkedIn actually uh, locking people out if your email address is on there. You have to do a password reset as well. Uh, also, the Wall Street Journal uh, went through and uh, has looked at the most common, most popular uh, email passwords just by looking at the uh, database. And scarily, over 3,000 <laughs> of the 188,000 were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, that... That looks horrible at first, but Gina, you said that there's there may be a reason behind this. There is a reason. So it that does seem really horrible. And I just said that the Gawker's audience is generally pretty tech savvy. So that kind of, this kind of doesn't make sense, right? That these passwords would be so, uh, you know, so so bad and weak. But the reality is that to create a Gawker account, you could do it by just sending an email uh, to uh, to an email address, a special address for a post. Gawker didn't verify uh, email addresses. People made kind of throwaway accounts uh, to to comment on, on the site, kind of one-off deal. So I think a lot of these passwords people just chose because these weren't these weren't real accounts that they were using, you know, using a lot or passwords that they were using on other services. I spent, I was up until 3 a.m. on Sunday night, grepping through the data and looking for my friends, just kind of, you know, warn them about this. And, and I found, you know, half a dozen people that I know and that I email personally and they all said, oh, that, that account, like I never, I don't use that password for anywhere else. It was just a throwaway account. Yeah. It's almost like anonymous uh, commenting, huh? Nate? Exactly. Exactly. What I find really interesting about this is that um, in January this year, uh, there was a security, uh, data security firm called Imperva that did a, a survey of about 32 million um, passwords that were hacked from a different website. And they, uh, there was a report in The Telegraph that compiled the top 10 list of passwords not to use on the web. And eight out of these top 10 passwords not to use were in the top passwords on this Gorka list. So these passwords are really commonly used and are all absolutely terrible passwords to use. No one should be using I love you as a password or princess. I don't know why anyone would use princess as a or password. password. But it, <laughs> yeah, I mean, someone used Gorka on that, and this website that this yeah. uh, previous study came from was called Rock You, and Rock You was one of the top passwords on that site, too. Why so is it, it's Monkey one of the top passwords? I don't know. I thought maybe it was an inside joke on the site. I yeah. don't know about Monkey, but you know, Gawker, uh, or excuse me, Lifehacker and Gizmodo reported on these lists of weak passwords in the past, you know, before this all happened. So I think that a lot of this are just, or these passwords are just kind of snarky jokes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I saw a lot of things, you know, just kind of snarky jokes in passwords in lesser used passwords that people were using when they um, don't really care like you're saying right just, they is, just don't care it is fun to look through though and then see is. see the weird stuff like cheese <laughs> and indeed trust no one with the number yeah well that's one. an x files reference and, yeah, and yeah. that makes sense right yeah totally Those are users that brought a smile to my face <laughs> All right. This episode of Tech News today is brought to you by Ford and Voice Activated Sync. Uh, as you know. Leo's Mustang's point parked right out there. I can hop in that car with my Bluetooth phone. It'll recognize it right away. I can give voice-activated commands to flip through my playlists, send text messages, say, hey, Leo, borrowed your car, sends a text message right to him. Uh, I, can, I can actually uh, get turn-by-turn -turn directions. If I want to find the in and out in Petaluma to get a burger, I can do that. I can, uh, if I crash Leo's car and the airbags deploy, 911 is called right away. But they won't call Leo, hopefully, until I've figured out how to fix it. But it's all there. Ford and Voice Activated Sync allows you to do true hands-free calling while you drive. And it means you're probably less likely to crash because it's safer to keep your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. And there is now the new 2012 Ford Focus Global Test Drive. It's your chance to get a sneak peek at all new Ford Focus coming out in early 2011. 
Uh, you, there's a four-door model. There's a five-door hatchback. Uh, there's a five-door wagon. And if you would like to fly to Madrid to test drive it before most of the world has, uh, you can you can get that. You can get that to happen. All you got to do is pick a charity. Why do you got to pick a charity? Here's what's going on. Ford's going to donate $10,000 to a charity of your choice. If you create a video and then upload that at twitfordfocus.com and you're selected, then you get flown to Spain. So you get to drive the Ford Focus. You get a trip to Madrid. You're going to the Spain Spanish National Institute for Aerospace Technology. All you got to do is create your video by December 31st, 2010. Keep it short, you know, less than two minutes. Shorter the better. Make it compelling. Put it up there at twitfordfocus.com. Take a look at everybody else's videos and comment them. Uh, let, let people know what you think of their videos. And uh, you could be flying to Spain for the 2012 Ford Focus Global Test Drive. Go on over there now. You can open another tab and keep us, uh, keep us going while you uh, listen to the show. Twitfordfocus.com. We thank Ford for their support. All right, just saw this uh, story thanks to Virgilio on uh, Twitter right before we started the show. The U.S. Air Force has blocked access for computers on its network to the New York Times and The Guardian and at least 23 other websites who are carrying stories that contain the text from the WikiLeaks documents. This according to a spokesperson on uh, Tuesday. Major Tony Tones, a spokesperson at Air Force Space Command in Colorado, said the command blocked at least 25 websites uh, and the Air Force routinely blocks Air Force network access to websites hosting inappropriate materials or malware. Uh, and we've had people write in and explain to us that if a computer carries classified information on it, that computer becomes classified in many situations. And that's why you're told, do not go to the WikiLeaks site. But isn't this a little different to be going to just the New York Times and, the, and therefore be blocking the New York Times? It starts to feel a little like the Chinese blocking CNN over the Nobel Prize announcement. Yeah, why don't they just block the entire internet and get it over with? Yeah, because you're likely to find WikiLeaks all over the place, right? Mm hmm Yeah, I mean, the, the site's been mirrored everywhere. I mean, there was one uh, reaction that I remember reading. It was about, um, from I think a, 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 a politician or who was giving advice to um, uh, students who were looking to enter into, um, into government, say, don't read these websites, don't read these leaks, don't follow these guys on Twitter, because this can be traced to you and could harm your career in the future as a member of the government or, or, or something similar. And it was, it was a pretty harsh reaction, but um, it kind of seems a similar case to that. It's kind of more as a warning, like, don't read this, because it could you know, hurt you in future. But it, it does seem like a massively kind of grateful firewall of China sort of reaction. Now, the difference is... China was trying to deny that the person deserved the Nobel Prize in that case. In this case, there's more of a bureaucratic reason, it seems like. And I guess it makes sense. If, you, if you're going to say any computer that goes to WikiLeaks and sees these leaks becomes classified because that's still technically classified information, it wouldn't matter if it's in the New York Times, right? It's still classified information, as odd as that may seem. A little odd, yes. It doesn't, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> I can feel anymore, your brain it? trying to wrap around the issue. <laughs> the, the mental gymnastics it's requiring to understand bureaucracy and regulations. Well, it's a, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to cause quite a lot of discussion. Uh, uh, and, and it shows the problem when you get this much information coming at once. It's hard for these intricate systems to react and figure out what to do. I doubt that they're going to uh, to keep the New York Times blocked forever from the U.S. Air Force, but you never know. France says Google is the main cause of the publishing woes of the newspaper business because of their dominance uh, and, and the ability to uh, get all of your news at Google News. However, uh, the French La Torité de la Concurrence, I'm not even going to try to make it sound French, uh, said that Google is not abusing that dominance yet, Gina. So what does that mean? <laughs> I, my favorite quote, my favorite phrase in this entire story is economic paratism. Paratism? Parasitism? Parasitism. Yeah. Parasitism. Thank you, Tom. Yes. Um, so, yeah, this is a weird story. So they're dominating, but they're not taking advantage of that. And, uh, and it's especially bad for publications that show up in Google News. But publications can pretty easily opt out of showing up in Google News. And any website can opt out of showing up in Google search results. Uh, normally, websites don't do that because Google drives traffic to them. So this whole story is sort of boggling. Yeah, it's, it kind of feels like 
Rupert Murdoch has been over to France and had a chat over dinner with some guys in France, and uh, they've sort of learned his thinking. But, you know, as Gina says, you can opt out. It's not difficult to opt out of, uh, of Google News. And, you know, I don't really know why anyone would particularly want to. You know, Google News is not stealing content. It is pointing, con pointing people to your content. And, you know, I think that the, the, the quote in here that the dominance is, of course, not wrong in itself kind of speaks for itself. You know, it's, it's a non-issue. They're not going to act on this. Um, I don't think at all. The other thing they've done here is uh, sort of give a, a little bit of a, a, a nod of consent to a consortium of eight French news publishers who want to jointly operate paid digital news kiosks, uh, which w it was feared they might not be able to do that because of concerns about a cartel. But if they're saying, well, Google's dominant, but that's OK, as long as they're transparent and as long as they don't abuse that dominant position, then uh, they're sort of saying, you know what, we welcome a consortium of French publishers. But this this all seems to constantly ignore the fact that you actually can control whether you show up in Google, as, as Gina was pointing out. Uh, I, I don't know if people forget that or they just don't understand it or, or, or how that works. But you can decide not to be indexed and not to have that traffic sent to you. It's easy. You want to be unpopular? Put up a firewall. Put up a, uh, put up a robots.txt. Put up a paywall. Nobody will see your stuff. You'll be safe from all of that. Comcast is testing out a new set-top box. They internally call it X Caliber with an X instead of an EX because Xfinity is their cable TV brand. Uh, but the device is said to bring a bit of web video and some basic connections to social networks to the cable television experience. So could this be a way in which we get internet television slowly by the cable companies adding it to their boxes until they don't need to deliver the television over the pipes anymore. They just deliver the web video to you. Is that something we could get? Gina, what do you think? Uh, I mean, possibly. I mean, they're going to sell a lot more of these, right? Because you're buying a lot of a lot of people are buying their set-top boxes from the cable company already. Um, this, you know, the 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 article said that Excalibur is is. Um, Seeking the edge on Google TV. I mean, the Google TV's big sell is that it's got this full browser on the box, a full browser with tabs and all that kind of thing. This does not have that. Um, but, you know, would Comcast run into the same kind of trouble that, say, Google TV ran into with, with websites getting blocked? I mean, because they won't, right? Because it doesn't have that full browser. So it's not like you can go to Hulu or ABC.com to get your shows. Right. Um, well, do you think that they would be able to make deals with the networks that Google or Roku couldn't? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, they certainly would be able to make a deal with NBC if they buy NBC Universal. That that well, would be easy. But they've yeah. also they've also got an edge in dealing with the other networks, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they do. They do, right? But I still think the nerds are going to be buying the Roku boxes and possibly maybe the next generation of the Google TV over this. But mainstream consumers may be more likely to get this. I think you, what what will actually solve it is when it's built into the television and you buy your television and it gets that. We already have that a little bit with widgets, but something like Google TV that's just built in the television and you go home and plug it into the Internet and you get everything you need. That's when it really conquers the massive non-nerd populace. And I don't see Comcast or any other cable company or satellite company able to do that. They have too much vested interest in keeping the box out of your television. That's why they've they've dragged their heels on things like cable card. Really good point. It's true. Nate, is this something in the UK that uh, you could you could see happening, or you've got a whole different universe over there with Freeview and with the with the license fees and everything? How does how does this even fit? Yeah, um, it's it's a bit weird because we're kind of behind you guys um, f for this. We only really have two kind of set-top box providers. One is Sky and one is Virgin Media. Um, you guys are further ahead uh, than us in that aspect. But, I mean, at the moment, I have a, you know, a Virgin Box and I get BBC iPlayer for free and, you know, all the catch-up shows for free. And if I want to do anything even remotely related to the Internet on there, I do it on my iPad or on my Mac or... You know, I have ne there's not been a single time I've ever wished I had any part of the internet on my TV. I had that in about 1999, and it was terrible. It had a wired keyboard, and it was rubbish. Um, I don't see any real attraction to it. So um, I'm kind of curious to see what all that could mean for the UK, because I'm not sure at the moment right now there's a, there's a place for it in the market. Um, so I'm really curious. And I'm really curious about the Google TV. I mean, just to put this into context, we have just been told we're going to get um, TiVo. You know, like this year, uh, this month, in fact. So, um, 
that gives you some sort of indication as to where we are in terms of this connected boxes thing. Yeah, we're just waiting uh, for TiVo to get all the kinks worked out. Um, <laughs> yeah, in a way. I think we had TiVo about six, seven years ago, I think, on some network. I don't even know who. Um, frankly, I, I'm not sure it's going to stick around because I'm not sure what it's going to offer better than anything else. But, um, you know, I'm all for seeing what comes of this. But I, I just look forward to the time where what's broadcast in one country is available at the same time in another country because that is the real uh, advancement we need to make. The fact that Futurama broadcasts in the U.S. before it broadcasts here just seems utterly ridiculous to me. Right. So, and the uh, IT crowd and the Doctor Who broadcasting in the BBC before, or, or Channel 4 before it gets to the U.S., same thing in reverse. I think that's the way the internet should be leveraged in terms of set-top boxes, is that it should be giving you content instantly the same time it's available in another country because that's what the internet enables. Um, we've had you know, chat on TV for a long, long time. If you want to do it, you can do it. It's not hard. Uh, it just doesn't look great. I think the, the real evolution is going to be kind of a global network of TV. Um, I don't know. Maybe this is something for forecast. Yeah, but right. That's, yeah, we're starting to that's the evolution I see. Um, and this is kind of just a small step towards that. What is not an evolution is uh, the fact that Steve Ballmer at the CES keynote this year will be talking about tablets. He did that last year. Uh, probably different tablets. He's not going to show off the HP Slate this year. He's going to show off a Samsung tablet is what Engadget's reporting. Uh, possibly the Samsung Gloria, the one with the slide-out keyboard. Uh, and there's also a lot of talk that there will be a, either a, a tweak on Windows 7, like a layered version of Windows 7 that shows up when the keyboard is stowed away and you're in portrait mode. More of a tabletified layer for Windows 7. Possibly a sneak peek at Windows 8. I'm guessing we won't see much of Windows 8, except just an acknowledgement that it's coming. Uh, and maybe we'll hear that it's coming in the latter half of 2011 or in 2012. Maybe we'll hear something like that. But I don't even expect that. We're going to see a bunch of tablets, though. Does this excite anyone, or is this just Groundhog Day, Gina? Are you, are you, are you excited about the Windows tablets? Well, it's kind of Groundhog Day. I mean, I, I think Microsoft just needs to hope it's not too little too too late. Uh, but hey, I'm all for competition and, um, you know, tablets are, tablets are the hot thing. They have been for a while. <laughs> just hurry up, Microsoft. Nate, do you think Microsoft could show us anything different here? No, not this year. Next year, I think possibly. I think that um, Windows Phone 7 is, um, I think it's very much a 1.0 product, but it's a good product. Um, I like it a lot. And I think that what we'll see is basically a tablet version of that. Any tablet version of Windows is going to more closely resemble um, uh, Windows Phone 7 than it's going to resemble um, Windows 7 or Windows 8 or whatever. Maybe Windows 8 will encompass some of that. I'm not quite sure. But um, I think that it's exciting. I think they've done a really good job with Windows Phone 7, and I'm looking forward to see the next step. But I do think if they don't do something in the next 12 months, they've lost it kind of probably forever. Um, but what they did with Xbox. They kind of pulled that around. So I'm hopeful. I want to see what they do. Um, I think Windows Phone 7 shows that they can do something good with mobile. Um, but we'll see. All right, let's take a quick break. Thank our other sponsor, Gazelle. It's uh, about time for you to rustle up a little bit of change to buy those holiday gifts. And Gazelle would be a great way to get a little extra coin and clear out those gadgets to make room for the gifts you're going to get. What you do with Gazelle is you sell your, or recycle your used electronics, your smartphones, your MP3 players, your ebook readers, old laptops. They've got over 200,000 unique items and 20 product categories listed on the site. So here's what you do. You take your gadget, you go online, you put in the name of the gadget, you find it, you give them the condition, tell them whether you got all the wires and accessories. They'll give you a quote of how much they'll pay you for it. And that's it. You don't have to do any of the, the legwork, the hard work. All you got to do is send them the gadget. In fact, they'll even send you a box for it. And then you get a check from them. It's that easy. Even if it's something too old that they can't pay you for, they'll recycle it for you responsibly so you know it doesn't end up in some landfill some way. So uh, why don't you go check it out? Gazelle.com. Give it a try. You can get your uh, you get your payment as, a, as an Amazon uh, gift certificate. You can get it as a, ch a direct check. Uh, it's a really, really good way to get rid of gadgets. I've done it a bunch of times and, and, and made a nice little uh, little bit of money off of it so if you need a little extra money you need to clear out a little space go to gazelle.com find out how much your old gadgets are worth get rid of them get some cash and get a five percent bonus when you use the bonus code tnt don't just sell it gazelle it as they say go to gazelle.com for a five percent bonus code use the offer code tnt time now for the news fuse Really want to hit the old guard where it hurts? Hit them in their mimeographs. Except mimeographs aren't networked. Hey, next best thing, they're fax machines. 
Office managers at Amazon, MasterCard, PayPal, Visa, and others apparently can no longer receive faxes. It's all part of Mission Leak Flood's denial of service attack against fax numbers, part of the ongoing WikiLeaks anonymous denial of service attacks. A database leak in Mesa County, Colorado, made public the information of 200,000 suspects, victims, and informants working with the Sheriff's Department there. A county IT employee who had legal access to the database copied it to another server in April, saving it as a giant, unencrypted, plain text file. The server was discovered and the information spread on the Internet. Oops. Big oops. Meanwhile, Julian Assange was granted bail at 200,000 pounds. I think it's about... $300,000, uh, as long as he hands over his passport, wears an electronic monitor, and checks in with the police every night before he turns to Ellingham Hall, where he's staying uh, in the UK. Uh, even with all that, Assange is still not free to roam, as Sweden has appealed the decision, so he'll stay in jail until the appeal is heard. Fred Silverman, you remember that name? He headed up all three major U.S. TV broadcasters at one time or another in the 1970s. He greenlighted classics like All in the Family and The Waltons. And he's got a new project. At the end of December, expect a media blitz for Blip City, a live streaming video social networking thing. Kind of like a stick'em or a U Ustream, I think. Uh, according to a job posting, the site will, quote, rock the entertainment world in the areas of mobile, online, TV, and celebrity. In November 2009, Hank Rison of Blue Beat put up the entire Beatles catalog online for sale at about 25 cents a song. EMI, of course, immediately sued, but Rison claimed they weren't Beatles songs. They were psychoacoustic simulations with entirely new and original sounds. Judge Josephine Stanton Tucker said no, they're Beatles songs, <laughs> and found Blue Beat liable for copyright infringement, misappropriation, unfair competition, and conversion. The old uh, judicial principle of sounds like a Beatles song. It is a Beatles song. It's a Beatles song. <laughs> Uh, Amazon's MP3 application is now available for download from the BlackBerry app world. The app will let you purchase and download music over both Wi-Fi and over the air, and includes plenty of BlackBerry-specific functionality, including sharing via BlackBerry Messenger, in addition to the usual social networking features, and full integration with BlackBerry's universal search and media library. The U.S. Army oh, yeah. is considering uh, giving each of its soldiers a smartphone and may give them a choice between Apple's iPhone or an Android phone, uh, as well as paying the monthly bill for them. The plan would make it easier for soldiers to access data and receive updates on the go. Commercial phones would fit into a special antenna sleeve, allowing them to link to the Army's network via a patchwork of ground stations and airborne nodes. Airborne nodes. I like that. <laughs> Google released an updated version of its Google Voice app for the iPhone on Tuesday that added support for the iPod Touch and iPad. The update also added support for placing calls with click to call, added a do not disturb setting, a text forwarding preference in the app, improved address book support, and fixed several bugs. All right, let's finish up with OK Go using GPS to spell their name out in LA. Uh, they, were, they were using an app that traces you and then shows your route uh, as you walk, it's a uh, it's an LED musical parade through Los Angeles, and uh, it, it, what, so what they did is they went out on the streets with a band, uh, started parading around, and then recorded the trace on the app. A uh, hundred friends, some instruments, Range Rover Evoke GPS app tracking their movements, and they their their route spelled out OK Go. <laughs> Be it's cooler. a really good video as well. It's a really, really fun video. Well put together. It's kind of like, it's just got a lot of footage of people responding to the videos in like restaurants and uh, police and motorcycles and things. It's, it's kind of entertaining just to watch it, even if you don't like what they're doing, uh, which is true of many things on the internet, frankly. But um, it is a good video. These guys are always doing crazy stuff like this. The little, uh, little social ex anthropology experiment, if nothing else. All right, time for the calendar. And Best Buy is uh, telling you you need to get in line. They're going to open up at 8 a.m. for Nexus S sales on December 16th in the U.S. 210 Best Buy stores. They say you can only get two. Uh, you can only get two Androids per person. And there's a there's a list on the net if you want to find out how many Nexus S's are going to be available. So uh, iPhone-like lines for the Nexus S. Also, uh, there is a, a plan for the IBM Watson computer to show up on Jeopardy 
against two of the show's most successful champions, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. They'll play two games against Watson. He is a computer program developed by IBM's artificial intelligence team. Matches will be spread out over three days and will air February 14th through the 16th of next year. And finally, don't forget, uh, you can be a part of Tech News Today this holiday season. Either send us what you think your favorite moment of the year is for our year-end special or apply to be in our open mic special. You can find both things at bit.ly slash TNT Holiday 2010. Let's finish up with some emails. Uh, we got a couple here. First one is from Mike who suggests a password management tool. We talked about a few ways to do better password management on yesterday's show. He's recommending PWD Hash from Stanford University, which takes your password. You can use the same password every time. And then it takes the URL of the site you're logging into and creates a hash based on them. PWD Hash is a browser plugin. So you just press F2 before typing in the signal that PWD Hash should replace the password with. And boom. You've got your login. And if you're on a computer that you don't have PWD hash installed on, he says, you can go to pwdhash.com uh, and it will create the hash for you. It's pretty cool. There's there's lots of cool little password managers like this, right, Gina? There are. There are. There's lots of options. Uh, I think you said you use one one password. I use LastPass. And there are lots of little bookmarklets that, that can generate, you know, really big, random, difficult to guess passwords. And, and this sounds like it's one of the good ones. And finally... From Craig, he tips us off to the best ever tablet PC ever coming January 2011. It's the Barnes & Noble Nook, which is a real Android device, the color, the Nook color. And they're going to upgrade it to Android 2.2 and add the, add the Android Marketplace in January. Uh, so you get a 100% tablet PC like an iPad, but it's actually an ebook reader and only costs you 250 bucks. Sounds pretty awesome. Bugging. Okay. Yeah, bargain at two hundred fifty bucks. <laughs> now, Gina, you were saying we've heard we've heard that there might be some limitations to the Android marketplace. It might not be the full marketplace, right? It might not be the Android market. It might be a Barnes and Noble market, uh, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I guess my real question about this is: the Kindle app going to run on the Nook? Uh, because if it is, then I'm in. So you could run Kindle on your Nook, <laughs> right. and you get all the books that you bought on the Kindle. Well, this is the thing. I'm invested. I have a lot of Kindle books. Yeah, I, I'd like to get them on my on whatever e-reader that I that I want. So that'll be interesting to see if that's if that's will be a possibility. Now, someone in the chat room points out Ars Technica says Barnes and Noble has uh, contacted them to say that the smartphone magazine uh, article is not accurate. While an update to a newer version of Android should roll out earlier next year, there are no plans to enable official access to the Android marketplace. No. Oh. So you're not going to see a Kindle app. Ugh. Uh, Surely there I will be hacks. Be the best e-reader in the world. Somebody will read I mean, we it, don't though. Have, we don't have the Nook here, but it sounds amazing. And with Kindle on it, that could be uh, pretty good. It's a shame. Yeah, it is a shame. Uh, and, and on that sad note, we have to end. Nate Langson, thank you so much uh, for being on the show. And let folks know where they can find your work on the internet. Okay, so I'm uh, at wired.co.uk. We have a podcast there as well, at uh, wired.co.uk slash podcast. Um, I have a, a new blog uh, of my own, which is uh, outside of Wired stuff, which is uh, letters to burn oh, cool. net. And I'm on Twitter, of course, uh, at Nate Langson, N-A-T-E-L-A-N-X-O-N. Letters to burn.net. I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, it's brand new. So there's not lots on it yet, but there will be. And Gina Trapani, a pleasure as always. Watch her on This Week in Google and let folks know uh, the other stuff you're up to. Great to be here. You can find me at smarterware.org or uh, follow me on Twitter, just my name, Gina at Gina Trapani. All right, that's it for us, folks. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. Email us TNT at twit.tv. Or give us a call. Leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll see you next time. <laughs>